So let me uh, just say a few words about uh, myself. And then we'll have a few slides um, to share with you. Um, when I spoke to the Joint Committee on Environment and Climate Change, and uh, Thomas and his colleague Murray were there a few weeks ago, um, I used the word cosmo-local, and uh, it's been picked up in some of the media coverage. I think I puzzled quite a few people. That I love to do that. Um, but I just want to uh, honour the presence of Rose Kelly here tonight. By cosmo-local, we mean that it's an agenda, a movement, an, an idea that is intensely local. You know, it's only meaningful if it's implemented, imagined, created uh, in terms of its local uh, meaning and impact. But it's also global, planetary, and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a global movement. It's also an idea that has um, a reality in indigenous thought and practice and spirituality across the world. So I just want to honor both the pioneering role of Rose Kelly, um, who has been leading this in Donegal, um, and also the presence of Thomas, who's been leading at the global level. So we're, you know, we've got a, a couple of pioneers with us who really sum up that idea that it's, uh, it's, it's a very intimate agenda, but it's one that we share uh, in, a, in a deep solidarity with indigenous peoples across the world as well. Um, about myself, I, I work with the School of Law. I describe myself these days as an activist academic. So I, I take uh, a fairly activist uh, interest in these uh, issues. I've been writing about deep ecology for over 30 years. I've been uh, deeply critical of the neoliberal uh, institutionalist approaches to environmental conservation, mostly at the international level, but also in uh, in Ireland, uh, because of the economic neoliberal economic framing of uh, many of our responses to the environmental crisis. I would argue, have argued for over thirty years, that in many ways, the modernist framing. The modern European modern framing of our responses to the ecological crisis merely reproduce the problem. We very rarely get to ask the, the most profound questions that match or measure up to the depth of the crisis that, has, that is unfolding in terms of the collapse of our biodiversity and uh, uh, systems of, of uh, life sustenance. Okay, so let me see if I can put up some slides and give you a quick overview of what uh, we've been doing, uh, going back to the or the beginnings of the uh, of the, uh, the the citizens' assembly. Uh, let me see. So when we when the Environmental Justice Network Ireland um, uh, was launched, um, it was already apparent that um, a movement was stirring across the, especially across the, the border counties, both in Derry and Donegal. And I think that's no accident. Um, um, there's a, there's a, a strand of uh, decolonial theory and thought called border borderland thinking. And it's really about the receptivity of people who live in the in-between worlds, the receptivity of people who live um, at the edges of dominant legal and economic narratives and their capacity to tune in to new ways of thinking and new ways of being. And I think that's uh, the, you know, the, 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 uh, the rights of nature movement has its origins in the borderlands for that, for that reason. There's a particular genius that comes with uh, living on the edge, living in the cracks, as the Nigerian uh, scholar would say, bio Akonbalafi, living in the cracks. So some resources, the EGNI were kind enough to provide 
some funding for me to go off uh, with a, a number of colleagues to uh, script and produce a film. And we co-opted uh, John Spillane to help us uh, tell the story of the rights of nature from an Irish perspective, but also from a theoretical and global perspective. And there's a very clear linkage with the economic agenda, uh, that European modern idea that um, has led to our uh, rather exceptional European mindset, which has come to regard nature as a thing, um, as something that only derives value or largely derives value from its uh, um, exchange value. It's, uh, it's uh, the way in which it services our economic activities. So have a look at that film. Um, it's a really interesting one. John uh, allowed us to use some of his music and he wrote uh, put Armigan, the song of Armigan to music for the film as well. Another resource is the EGNI's submission to the Citizens' Assembly itself. We, uh, uh, a number of scholars, put together a, quite a robust uh, argument uh, inviting the Citizens' Assembly on biodiversity loss to consider the rights of nature as a, a fundamental response to its uh, mandate to look at uh, the reasons for biodiversity loss and some uh, responses. Um, and I think we had some influence. I think that document, uh, the fact that EG and I were out there alongside people like Rose uh, and the campaigners in Derry and other local authorities um, had some impact on the Citizens' Assembly. You'll know by now that the Assembly uh, has recommended two sets of, uh, uh, well, a referendum for constitutional change, uh, which would incorporate the human right to a healthy environment and the rights of nature. And we're, uh, well, those recommendations are now in the hands of a joint committee on the environment and climate action uh, at the uh, Leinster House. And they've issued a first draft report. And tomorrow they will consider a series of amendments to that report. Um, a lot of the language is very positive, um, but uh, there is one amendment which could scupper the entire um, project. Um, so a few of us are working, or we'll be working late tonight to try to um, uh, ensure that that doesn't happen. Um, I'll say a little bit more about that uh, later on. Now, apart from the EGNI submission, um, I also got to work with an, uh, an indigenous leader in Ecuador, um, Franco Natiri Gualinga, uh, who recorded a very powerful intervention, uh, an appeal to the Citizens' Assembly and to all Irish citizens to look at the indigenous uh, support for the rights of nature and inviting us to look at our own indigenous Irish mythopoetic and linguistic traditions for similar inspirations. Uh, now, behind that is the notion, really, that this is not just about a legal shift, it's an ontological shift, and it's one that we have access to, you know, in terms of the, our, the, the way we relate to ourselves and we understand ourselves and regard nature, that we can look to our mythopoetic traditions, or even our ancient Brehan laws, and find inspiration for our support for the rights of nature in our own island traditions. We don't have to regard this rights of nature movement as a, an exotic import. In fact, it would be quite uh, weakened if that was the only way we were to um, approach it. These are the recommendations from the Citizens' Assembly. And uh, when I, I addressed the UN uh, General Assembly's annual session on harmony with nature, along with the chair of the uh, the Citizens' Assembly, Evin uh, O'Sullivan. She told me that the film by the Ecuadorian uh, leader had had a real impact. Um, and it was reported uh, on the RTE News after the report was launched by the Citizens' Assembly, confirming that that uh, particular intervention had really moved a number of people who would all then to support 
the uh, recommendations in the report of the Citizens' Assembly. It's really worth remembering, and uh, we're trying to get the committee in Leinster House to honour this as well, that the rights of nature as a proposal, as a fundamental recommendation, also emerged from the uh, Children and Young People's Assembly, which took place in parallel with the Citizens' Assembly uh, last year. Uh, my son was uh, um, a part of that uh, process. Uh, so I got to see some of those sessions and they also talked about the rights of nature, the need to reclaim that idea that nature is relative, a relative. I'm going to uh, ask Thomas now to stand by. Um, there's a lot of language around rights and the law and constitutions and legality. Um, but I, I think to really get a, a sense of what we're talking about here, it's useful to familiar, familiarize ourselves with this notion of ontology. Um, we're talking about shifting our way of being in the world. You know, a, a different uh, relational understanding of ourselves, uh, an understanding of our, ourselves as embedded in a series of relationships that extend to nature. Uh, and uh, internally, we're part of nature ourselves. We're not... Um, forgive me, theologians among you, we're not fallen angels, we're not sovereign beings who stand over nature. We um, we are indebted to, entangled with, and, uh, and part of uh, natural systems. And the, the notion of ontology captures this, you know, that its preliminary uh, definition uh, is uh, as an inventory of assumptions about the world, for understanding the world, including what kinds of beings can exist and what conditions and what relationships. That idea of relationship is profoundly central to this idea of an alternative ontology. Um, and it's part of a, an emerging academic uh, and cultural conversation. We're hearing more and more about the more the human, about entanglement as a defining, uh, uh, as a defining idea that defines us. And Right away, once you appreciate that or begin to rehearse that in your language, uh, in your reflections about the meaning of your lives, um, the notion of care comes to the fore rather than domination or exploitation. So it's it's no accident that communities and countries who've experienced colonization, who have experienced the imposed narratives from uh, Europeans, that the pushback against those European ideas, those European philosophies, often linked to uh, Descartes or the Cartesian thought, uh, the pushback has come from these indigenous spiritualities and practices who experience life, have a regard for life, um, which is very different. You know, it's completely uh, immersed in that notion of, uh, of uh, belonging and respect and uh, regard. I'll hand over to Thomas and uh, be happy to take some more questions after Thomas gives a, a, an overview of what's happening uh, internationally on the rights of nature movement. Thomas, over to you. Thank you, Peter. And uh, just at the outset, just to thank everyone who's been involved with the Citizens Assembly process. I know it's been a lot of sleepless nights for Peter and, and others, but uh, it's much appreciated on this end. So I just wanted to speak relatively shortly about kind of uh, back to this uh, notion about you know where rights of nature concepts have come from, how they are in service to environmental activists, uh, and to talk a little bit about where we we came from. So I'm the uh, senior lawyer for the Center for Democratic and Environmental Rights, and we advise uh, organizations and governments uh, around the globe on advancing rights of nature legislation and litigation. And uh, just very briefly, my background is as an environmental organizer. So uh, we, for about a decade, attempted to enforce uh, the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, other national environmental laws in the U.S. Uh, against things like hydrofracking for natural gas and large-scale factory hog farms and all the kinds of things that environmental communities try to stop on a daily basis. And what we found was that, you know, in a parallel with what Peter has been saying, that the law is really not set up to 
allow nature to be a party to these proceedings. They're basically about humans fighting it out over who has the right to use what. Uh, but it's not really about nature having a role uh, in in what happens to rivers or forests or mountains or those types of things. And so in 2006, we wrote the first rights of nature law uh, in a small community in the state of Pennsylvania in the U.S. on the East Coast. Uh, and the reason to write that was not to announce at a 30,000 foot academic level that we're now going to think about nature differently. It was about giving real tools to people in the community who had given up hope on the state or federal government to actually help them. This was after a decade of trying to beg and plead governmental officials to actually protect nature and ecosystems in those communities, that we devised rights of nature, these laws, as not only recognizing that nature could have rights and did have rights, like the right to flow for a river, for example, but that people in the community had a democratic right to actually enforce those laws. So there's a there's a big democratic movement component to this work, as well as recognizing that our current environmental laws have failed miserably and that we need something different that actually in which the law actually sees nature. Uh, instead of just seeing competing humans uh, over the question of how are we going to use or exploit nature uh, in the first place. So uh, long story, a little bit shorter, is that uh, the work we did in the States back in 2006 got the attention of Ecuadorian environmental and indigenous activists who began to drive this rights of nature concept into the Ecuadorian constitution. And we were called in to assist with writing the language. The Ecuadorians uh, eventually overwhelmingly ratified uh, that constitutional provision, becoming the first country in the world to recognize uh, legally enforceable rights of nature within a national constitution. Uh, the one and only still, uh, Ecuador is the only country that has actually written rights of nature into their national constitution. They were followed by national laws being passed in Bolivia, Uganda, New Zealand, Panama, uh, Spain. So different places that passed national level legislation, not constitutional provisions, but national level legislation. And then there have been a bunch of uh, local and state lawmaking in places like Brazil, Mexico, and Canada. In the states, in the US, we have 38 uh, municipal governments, and tribal governments, so indigenous communities that have passed uh, rights of nature laws in the US. And those include the city of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which passed in 2010, uh, became the largest municipality in the US to pass a rights of nature a law. And then in 2020, a county, uh, 1.5 million people in a county in the state of Florida on the east coast of the US. Uh, became the largest municipality in the states to pass a rights of nature law to protect two rivers uh, that flow through that county. And again, the concept here is not, is it was in the states at least, not to do non-binding resolutions about how we feel about nature, which is always good to say and good to hear, but how do we give real practical tools to activists on the ground to actually make a difference in what ecosystems are protected and, and, and which ones aren't. Uh, and so the, that democratic component uh, slices through all of this. Uh, closer to home for you folks on the, on the local uh, stage uh, in uh, England, uh, there's been work now in the River Ouse uh, down in the Sussex region, south of London, uh, which we think is going to be the first in England uh, to pass a rights of nature law. They've already passed the resolution. Uh, so there's work happening there. As Peter mentioned, in Northern Ireland and in Ireland, you have some local uh, district councils that have passed these resolutions as well. And then finally, uh, something we didn't expect to happen, in addition to the local laws in the U.S., the national constitution in Ecuador, the uh, national lawmaking and local lawmaking in about 10 other countries, that courts in three places, Colombia, India, and, in Bang and Bangladesh, without any legislation whatsoever, so no written laws in place, began pulling examples from other places into environmental cases that they were hearing and actually established rights of nature for certain ecosystems in those countries on their own. 
to something we never foresaw happening, which was we thought all this would move through written legislation, but in 2016 in Colombia, 2017 in India, 2019 in Bangladesh, courts in those countries, judges declaring that this was uh, to be a new international norm of emerging environmental law, simply began to apply that uh, to existing environmental cases. So uh, the River Atrato in Colombia and in India, the River Ganges, uh, now has some recognized legal rights in Bangladesh. The courts decreed that all rivers in Bangladesh had certain legal rights. Uh, so again, that's kind of how this stuff has moved. Uh, it moved from very local in one very small place in the States, uh, then kind of expanded out uh, to these other locations. And as an environmental lawyer, we're always looking for those practical, very practical ways to apply uh, this. Uh, we see the rights of nature laws is really about liberating the most or, uh, or enabling the most uh, aggressive environmental defenders with the tools that they need to actually protect the natural environment. That's kind of how we see these laws uh, operating. Uh, and uh, that democratic component of, you know, we don't have the tools we need, we're going to pass these laws to give us the tools that we need to do this work. Uh, has been has been very important. It's been a resounding theme through these different through these different places. And just to to end before I pass it back to Peter is that um, people uh, always ask, well, you know, what about court cases? How the, how has this resulted in actual on the ground change? And perhaps the best place to to look to for that is Ecuador, which has a, a long history now of courts being asked to enforce those rights on behalf of rivers and cloud forests and mangroves to protect those mangroves from shrimp farming. Basically very discreet, very concrete examples of how these laws are being used to protect things that normally the existing environmental laws would not. And I think the, the biggest example of that was the Los Cedros cloud forest case, which was decided last year by the Ecuadorian Constitutional Court in which mining permits were thrown out, were overturned, that had been issued in the cloud in the Los Cedros cloud forest in Ecuador to basically stop mining there, finding that the rights of the cloud forest uh, were to be protected and enforced against these mining claims. So it, it's all about real, specific, practical application. It's about recognizing the democratic force that has come into play, that these are not just environmental protection laws, but they basically operate at the intersection of environmental protection and democratic control or local control over what happens to nature in certain localities. Uh, and those two forces have really come together to produce what I think is the next is the next big wave of environmental protection. It, I, I have no doubt that in the next uh, 10, 15 years being led by places like Ireland at this point that uh, these will these laws will become the default way or an augmentation of the way in which we protect ecosystems and the natural environment. So it's extremely exciting. You guys are on the cutting edge with the Citizens Assembly report and what's happening with the Parliamentary Committee. Uh, and uh, it's uh, been exciting to see and a pleasure on this end to be to be a small part of it. So with that, I'll pass it back to Peter. Thank you very much. I'll give you a quick overview. It's not, you know, we're at a, we've taken a good few actions, whether they're effective or not, around the rights of nature in Clare. We, first of all, we passed a motion at our plenary, a small plenary, but we passed a motion at our plenary saying that Clare PPN, not just the Environmental College, but the whole of Clare PPN would advocate for a rights of nature approach. So we did a little bit of work of explaining what that meant. That came in from one of our uh, great members, Emma Caron. Um, and Emma is a member of the really um, fantastic group, Future Proof Clare, who you probably have heard of. They're doing a lot of uh, work on various legal issues at the moment. So now they're spread very thin. So that we passed the motion at our plenary. Following that, we had a discussion with a couple of councillors, one Fianna Fáil and one Fianna Gael, just for the political uh, amongst you who might have been expected to be uh, supportive, you know, who generally work quite closely with the community. Now, I think we made a mistake. So I'm going to tell you the mistake because that might be instructive for other PPNs. So uh, uh, we they, we were exploring the idea of passing a motion, uh, getting a motion put into Clare County Council and passed on the rights of nature. So 
the one of the things we decided following that meeting, the councillor said, look, we can put this in and we can pass it. This was now not close to election time, just to say this was about a year and a half ago. But they felt and the people who were advocating within the PPN for it felt that it would be only an on paper motion, that there was no real buy in or understanding or what the motion was about and that they would rather do the work to make the motion effective. Now, I'm just going to say I think that was incorrect. Uh, uh, for us, we, we all made that decision together. And I think that was incorrect because passing the motion might have brought its own actions along with it. And one of the things that has happened since is we've got much nearer to the election. And because we're nearer to the election, the, the windows for cross-party councillor motions where they'll work together and all support things has narrowed there. It's quite, it, you know, it becomes quite competitive close to the election. So that's just to think that's that's uh, something, even if you think it's just a paper motion, getting the motion, then you could maybe build forward from the motion. So I, I just think we might have we might have ha acted with too much integrity um, to begin with. So that's one following that. Now we took we did a presentation. Of one of the uh, member groups who studies in this area and is, is, is very informed did a presentation we asked for and were granted the opportunity to do a presentation to our economic SPC. Quite interesting. There was the economic SPC, um, because in a way that's in a way it's the economic style thinking that we have to take on. Again, that had mixed mixed response. Um, you know, the level and capacity of our counselor, counselors to engage is very very varied. You know, we have you know we have people say we ha we have people who say think biodiversity is really important for our tourism, and others who think you know all life on the planet but you know that that's the that's the framework within so that that was worth doing but i think too early i think we would have been better off to pass the motion and put the education work afterwards so then then following that we we did, had a, you know we did a few other actions so basically we've been using it in every submission we submitted in the county development plan the response of the chief exec in their responses to the submissions was that this should go in the new biodiversity plan coming for Claire, which demonstrates a little misunderstanding for us about the all encompassing nature of it. Then we also made submissions. We made submissions to the Citizens Assembly ourselves. We used Environmental Justice Ireland and the Celt, Andrew, Andrew St. Ledger, who unfortunately has since passed away, had done some great work on the, the you know, forestry and the type of tree cover in Clare. So we used their submissions as well as our members' expertise and we did a submission to using rights of nature to the uh, the national biodiversity strategy. So two national level submissions. We also just recently did submissions to all of the, sorry, not a submission, we did an email contact to all of the TDs and senators in Clare about the joint Oireachtas committee and about the findings of the citizens assembly saying that Clare PPN members would like them to support to support and advocate for the findings of the assembly and just recently last week we did um just recently last week we wrote to the assembly again and the assembly is very familiar with Claire PPN just for we've presented to them on, on a couple of occasions so we wrote to them last week saying we wanted the assembly to really take on board particularly the constitutional provision so that's that's now we've had lots of different bits and pieces, you know, we kind of are including it in everything as we go along. But those are the actions we're taking now, uh, as I'm saying, those are low level, you know, those are kind of low level lobbying po policy in attempts to inform policy action. But one of the things that we're doing by those is making sure that the concept is getting discussed, mentioned thought of uh, in, in as many fora as we can. We are like, like, like a lot of the PPNs, you know, one of the things we are, our environmental college is struggling a little bit at the moment from a bit of burnout and a bit of the idea that they can be more effective outside the PPN framework than inside it. You know, the PPN takes a lot of time and effort. So now that's, that happens quite collaboratively in Clare. They kind of go, oh, you do the submission, will you? And uh, you know what I mean. So, so it ha it happens quite. We've we've some very, you know, we've some very strong uh, people in Clare, but there is a good level of trust between the environmental groups and ourselves around those issues. And so, if they haven't time to be getting a submission together, they they often just go, oh, you go ahead and do it. And we base it on previous submissions. So, but that lack of energy, lack of environmental act, uh, lack of environmental group energy through the PPN 
is not something that's that I would love to see at the moment. Now, if we needed to wheel them out to say who supported our submissions, would be absolutely no problem because they do. And that you know that there'd be that kind of level of collaboration between staff and the member groups. But there, there's that. And the other thing, just in terms of we've been pushing other angles through our PPN, we've been pushing other angles and other campaigns. Um, because of the other angles and campaigns we've been pushing, we've been getting a little bit of resentful pushback from the local authority. Now we've got great co cooperation. We've been working on their local economic and community plan and we've been doing, we were doing a huge project on enshrining just transition. Sorry, I'm not sure if you can see that, I've it blurred, but just transition and socioeconomic rights in. But it did, it has, we were, because we were being a bit, because we were being uh, successful with campaigning in other fields, some of the councillors started saying things like, but it's not the PPN, you know, it's not the PPN's council, it's not the PPN's LECP. Um, so so that was just an opportunity cost from our other uh activities. Sorry, that's that's where we've just had that report out. So that's that's just roughly where we are. It's useful to us. We more feel like we're taking it at a low level. I don't think, just gonna say, I don't think we would pass, I don't think we would pass a motion easily in advance of the elections in May. And just to say the responses that we got back from our uh, TDs and councillors around it were Fianna Fáil were back very strongly wondering, you know, were very strongly wondering how this would affect farmers. And, you know, the usual, just kind of a little bit of pushback. I, I have great faith in, this is only my personal views now, but I have great faith in the Sinn Féin uh, a senator on the committee in terms of environmental action, not huge, not huge faith that Sinn Féin will take risky action on the environment in the run up to an election when they're trying to keep certain aspects of the public happy. Um, I, I agree with Peter. Fine Gael don't seem to like it. We, you know, we have one, we have two very environmentally conscious Fine Gael councillors down with us, but it seems it doesn't seem like something that's getting their appetite. They keep saying things just for as for a warning because often these things come out in messages, but they keep saying things like such as we really need to be looking at adaptation now rather than mitigation just on climate action. Now we don't agree with that at all. We think there's a bit of a cop out being built in there, but the, but because they're saying it to us in different forums. We think that there might be messaging going on around that. And just another thing on the Green Party, nobody sue me now, but on the Green Party, we've been getting a lot of stuff about, you know, the human rights of people in other countries that we should be mining in Ireland because uh, the human rights of people in other countries aren't protected. So we've been just, we've been, you know, ju just to say it's like, it's like um, woke mining. We're going to do some woke social justice mining in Ireland and we're not buying that at all. Um, but it, you know, it it is about like, well, we're consuming these resources, so why are we ensuring why are we ensuring that the environmental impacts are happening elsewhere? But it's not a reasonable argument unless we can demonstrate, you know, unless we can demonstrate which mine will close because we can mine in Ireland. So just just th those are the those are the kind of pushbacks we're getting. Sorry if that's not now more positive, but you know, ju just in terms of I think we've a lot of work to do on all aspects of the environment before. The, the before an election and I wouldn't be letting I would be doing my very best to castigate them if they come up with another committee to decide on the citizens assembly recommendations committee because first of all first of all we've two democratic processes one is the people we have elected in the first place and then the second one is the citizens assembly so so uh, uh, you know uh, you know expert expert legal advice around the wording for constitutional amendment is fine once they've decided there's going to be a constitutional amendment. And that's that. That's kind of the message we'd be taking, I think, from Claire. So that's that's pretty much it for me. Unless anybody has any questions. Hello, everybody. Thanks, Sarah. As always, uh, a mine of information. Um, so uh, Tipperary PPN is actually at, just at the very beginning around the rights of nature campaign. Um, I'd just like to say hello to Sean and Mary and Patrick, who are members of our environmental group. So they meet quarterly at Cabra Wetlands. I don't know if anybody knows a uh, fantastic environmental education centre in the middle of Tipperary. Um, and the county council uh, comes and gives inputs and presentations uh, and we can ask questions and they can ask questions. And, and so we have a good working relationship. We've just done a quite a deep uh, submission to the local authority climate action plan and we're involved on the 
uh, advisory steering group of the local economic community plan that uh, Sarah was mentioning. So we have um, some experience through uh, pushing a herbicide policy through our environmental and climate action strategic policy committee and we we've signed the um the rights of nature petition for rights of nature island you know supporting the recommendations for change in the irish constitution and so it, it, it's growing it, we have our quarter one 2024 meeting in february uh again at cabra and alison hoff has agreed to come and just um you know explore and pinpoint and see how we can go around a, a campaign to get the local authority uh, plenary to uh, you know accept the rights of nature policy. So it, it's what's happening for us though is we're coming behind other campaigns, other experiences. So we have the uh, the PPN generic guidelines, we have the Westmead motion for the plenary. We have the Donegal motion example that, that you know that went to the actual uh, county council plenary. Um, and so we're moving towards, you know, doing the proposal and putting it in our plenary in spring. Ours will definitely, uh, Sarah, ours will definitely be after the local elections, you know, so uh, just because of the, the timing. But but I suppose where where we, we're coming from, and I note that Cavan and Carlo PPNs are here as well as ourselves, Claire and uh, County Tipperary, uh, something around a collective campaign with other PPNs and groups. And uh, Peter's put in the chat uh, a PPN caucus as a suggestion. So maybe this is something, you know, to move towards the collective influence to, you know, to influence the local authorities simultaneously, um, as I say, post local elections and just explore and work together to get the language and the strategic direction of the campaigns right, if you like, you know, uh, to, with that learning that that has gone before us, um, we also have our community climate coach project that's really taking off, and that would be a way of getting into the communities, and therefore into the families. You know that Cosmo local that word that I'd never heard until this evening. So thank you very much. I do love learning. So. Um, that's really all I'm suggesting that we come together, whether it's a PPN caucus, a collective campaign um, for uh, groups and PPNs who might be at the stage that we're at. And we have the wisdom of the 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 learning from Galway, Westmeath, Clare, Donegal and, and possibly others. So I suppose I'm just opening that out to uh, let's get moving collectively. So that's it, really, unless uh, anyone else has got anything to add. Uh, we're going to be moving forward. I'll put my email in the chat and, uh, you know, let's let's create a PPN caucus and it might be the way. And uh, let's get the local authorities more aware and the communities um, and the PPNs and uh, any other community groups. You know, what is the rights of nature? You know, because we're all learning, but we have to learn fast. Thank you. Of course, it's uh, an 18 month project that we are in partnership with uh, Clock Jordan Eco Village. It's funded through the Pubble Community Climate Action Strand 1. Uh, Community Climate Action Strand 2 is the funding that's that's uh, um, coming through the local authorities. So this is a, a national strand. And so what we've done is we've um, targeted workers and um active volunteers who are within communities uh, not all of them but some of them will be from uh, hard to reach seldom heard marginalized communities um so the idea is to um that the climate coaches will already have other strings to their bow this is a uh, this is a a string to their bow they can take back into their communities to have community conversations so part of it is to really connect with nature get that connection, you know, that we're talking about. Um, and then to uh, map climate action assets, uh, ecological assets within the municipal district districts of the county. And then thirdly, uh, have a conversation around identifying either a, a, a climate action resilience plan 
or a small climate action because a, a lot of communities don't know where to go. A lot of families don't know how to progress. They're sort of frozen. So it's to create that middle ground to, towards action. And then hopefully the funding will be available through the county councils. Um, the guidelines are a little bit strict, but hopefully the uh, um, the funding will be there or through leader. Um, so it, it's we decided on a 18 month project exactly for the same reason that it's urgent. Let's get out there. Let's get uh, activating and uh, empowering and giving confidence to people uh, to get moving. So that's the project. Thanks, Catherine, for inviting us along this evening. Um, I'm actually I'm not on the PPN, Joanna's, but um, I just give a very informal and probably mixed up report back from where we're at in Donegal. Um, I suppose for me, the rights of nature, like there've been conversations for a long, long time and no one celebrate water. We talked about it some years back um, and there's a, an organization called The Gathering, which is really a, a collective of, of communities and, and organizations and individuals who are working, working for nature um, and working for communities. Um, and as part of that gathering, rights of nature um, also emerged as an issue that a lot of people were interested in and a subcommittee was formed. And out of that, um, a meeting was called separate from the gathering by Mary McGuigan and I think James Orr in the spring of 2021. And anyone from the gathering or, or outside the gathering who was interested were invited to come along. So some of us went along, it was all, all on Zoom like it is now and it was still during all the COVID restrictions. But to cut a long story short, um, out of that meeting, uh, Maeve O'Neill, who at the time was a councillor in the Derry Straban region, um, said that she would bring a motion to Derry and Straban. Um, and like that, we had the debate. Sarah, you mentioned, you know, do you bring the motion forward first or do you do a lot of groundwork? So we decided to go, they decided to go ahead. Um, the motion was passed in Derry and Straban. So that was historical, the first on the island. Um, closely followed by Fermana Oma, and we thought, right, okay, let's go for it in Donegal. So we we took the the motion that Darian Straban and Fermana Oma um, had used, and we tweaked it to suit ourselves. One of the main thing we did is we extended the period um, of, I suppose, the liberations over the motion for over an eighteen month period. We brought the motion to a local rep, um, local councillor Albert Doherty, who we knew well and who had. A, a, a good uh, track record on environmental issues was always supportive. Um, he was didn't need any persuasion. So himself and his party colleague, um, Terry Crossan, brought the motion. They agreed to bring the motion to to the, the the whole council. Meanwhile, we sat and we we spoke with over the phone to all the councillors that that we could we could get, which was the majority of them. We um. We we sent them briefing papers from that were drawn up by James Orr of Friends of the Earth um, in Belfast and information from the Environmental Justice Network Ireland to sort of give them the background to, you know, where rights of nature come from and all the rest of it. Um, and then um, on the 13th of December, so we're coming up on two years, 2021, the motion was unanimously passed at council. Um, now, apparently there were some uh questions and queries and reservations, but Albert Doherty uh, made the point that, look, this is the beginning of a process. When the motion recognizing the rights of nature is passed, it, it ties us into like at least 18 months of consultation. So the motion was meant to, well, the motion does include, and what was, me what was meant to happen was that, that council would um, collaborate with the, I hate the term, but the stakeholders, the, the people who'd been involved um, and with civic society to design uh, public consultation processes to talk about what right to nature means, what it would mean in Donegal, how it could be, um, I suppose, integrated into all the council operations. Now, in reality, um, the council haven't done that. We, we and I'm, I, I genuinely am saying this, I don't mean there's no criticism here, I'm just stating it as, as happened. Um, we did make various approaches. Um, the people we'd speak to, like the 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 workers were very positive, but the powers that be um just haven't taken up the invitation. 
But um, I know personally myself, I take this strangely. Um, there's a positive in it because we we always said that the right to nature motion has to be grassroots. It has to come from the ground up. Um, the whole right to nature concept invites us to a shift in consciousness. It invites us to come out from beneath the dark enchantment that we've we've been under since the industrial revolution. Um, and so there is a shift that's needed in our mindset and there's a shift that's needed in, in how we work with each other and how we get things done. So it's actually, I feel personally, it's strangely better that we go slowly and we come from the last that's up. So we've been using this this period um, as an opportunity, as an opening, as a fun place where we've been sort of having the conversations in the community, organizing events. We've um we were invited to host the um Rights of Nature film that Peter mentioned earlier um at the Disappear Here Festival in the uh, in Clonmany in the summer. That was a really positive experience. Um we had several farmers there and I have to admit I was a wee bit nervous thinking, oh my God, they <laughs> you know, but it was actually really good. We we um I feel we seeded really good relationships. Um, they were now these were, they were there was a farmer there was a a farmer who 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 has been working with nature for years and years. Um, and I suppose didn't even realize that he was working on rights of nature, right? Um, he wouldn't have called it that, but that's what he's been working on. There was a young farmer who's working with farmers on the ground, saying, right, what can individual farmers do? you know, as opposed to like something coming down from on high. Um, and then there was an organic farmer. So they, they were kind of already edgy farmers for about a better word, but ha with strong links with the IFA, at least two of them. So I found that very positive. And then and Peter mentioned as well, you know, remembering that that we have, you know, we, we, we think of the indigenous peoples in South America and elsewhere who, who are teaching us so much and leading the way, but we also have, we have strong roots with nature as part recognizing that we are part of nature here on on this island um and at lunasa this year we decided to revive an old tradition of going to the well of bridget to recognize bridget as you know goddess if you want to go pagan and uh, and if it's christian well a saint who is very much a protector of nature so we started off at at greencastle the village of greencastle which is um where Loch Boyle and the Atlantic meet and mix and become so powerful. And we read out a declaration recognizing the rights of the foil. And then we walk back to the well to honor the guardians of the well and to remember where we come from and our responsibility as part of nature. Um, so we've been doing things like that. And I know Joanne has, has had a number of events over her way. Uh, we have a big county, so it's like, she's over in the West and we're up here in any show. Um, but alongside of that, we also have we've we've made a submission to the county development plan, um, basically to have rights of nature embedded in that. So we have support from councillors on it, and we're fingers crossed. Um, the idea is that that you know we we work on the ground, but we also keep getting rights of nature into the workings of the council, so that it's it's all coming together till we reach like you know a. Uh, like as 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 there's a phrase in that in that in 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 the in the book oh god it's gone out of my head now but the sea biscuit the crowded moment where where it'll come together and it'll help to turn the tide so um i probably rambled on a wee bit um more than more than i meant to um we we have i should also say we made a uh a submission based on the Environmental Justice Network Ireland submission to the Citizens Assembly. So we've done that as well. Um, and a big thank you to Peter and all the team who've, who've been working on that. And to Thomas, who's, who's I mean, their organisation has been just, you know, blazing a trail for us all. So um, I'll hand over to you, Joanne, because I've, I've probably... <laughs> well, I'm glad you went first, Rose, because I think it's uh, it's definitely the way to go. Um, and Peter, at the start, you know, um, put a, a bit of a, a, you know, the work that you do, Rose, is, is like I'm following on from, you know, we're just joining the 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 the, the tribe as such. But um, yeah, we are, Donegal is a big county and um, I was seeing the work that was being done uh, with the, the group of Rights of Nature. And then I'm a member of my environmental PPM pillar. 
So I was seeing that the the work was being done and the you know the motion had been passed, but not a lot of um not a lot of uh let's say um you know kind of like uh talking the talk but not walking the walk uh from our county council. So it was just a decision of mine. I'm a, a, a community development officer and I kind of coordinate the Donegal Community Guard Network. So the two films through the the rights of nature, I think the the one with um uh John's plan at the and also then and then the one with the the activists in the north, I think two films that I've been kind of like going around at any any opportunity and just sharing with the groups that I work with. So I think that they're really positive um videos that people can watch and they are free to view and you can download them onto your computer through Vimeo and you can just take it out and show it. And I think the next stage then through that kind of just raising awareness on the ground to to the local groups. Uh, and now we're bringing it to uh, kind of the ne next environmental uh, PPN agenda uh, to raise that. Because sometimes I think that, you know, holding a meeting on it and then you get lots of interest, but then people disperse. I think we're doing it the other way. We really are going in with the with the bottom up approach, uh, getting people interested. People are signing up and they're saying they're really interested in it. And yeah, uh, like that, um, then getting involved. And yes, I see their World Soil Day tomorrow, 5th of December. So we're also doing a, a bit of awareness through that. But I just think that um, it, through the likes of Rose and, and seeing all the action that's been done uh, in the Derry and then the Donegal um, district, it's very, you know, it's just lovely to have a tribe behind you. And I think that that's, that's what it's all about. So, um, yeah, I think that's that's all I've got to say. Well, it's great to hear what everybody has shared tonight, and I suppose our Galway uh, experiences will reflect uh, and echo some of that as well. And I suppose starting out just to say that, you know, that is that aspect of the tribe actually in motion and gathering. Um, I suppose what we really picked up on here in Galway and just been really inspired us by the art that had been and have been and continue to take place around the country and. Um, I loved uh, Rose, you know, referring to the shift in consciousness and giving time and allowing for that to, to actually slowly, slowly take place. Because I suppose that's what we really picked up on when we heard about kind of what, what had been taking place in the north and joining the, um, the there is a rights nature online meeting. So following an IEN um, a webinar uh, with Sullivan from the EJNI earlier in the year. That number was there for people uh, from different places around the country to get in on those conversations. And uh, I suppose there, that was just like kind of really inspiring, I suppose, that sense of what was, what was possible at the local level and different actions that had taken place and how could we maybe replicate them that here in Galway. So, um, I heard about the resources of the alums and the inspiring work. So we really wanted to put out uh, to the various communities to kind of, uh, you know, embed that in the local community conversation. We invited Linda for a biodiversity week back in May, but unfortunately uh, that got cancelled. But we actually managed to show that film at our PPN or the short one at the PPN plenary just last week. So uh, as Joanne was saying, it's a really wonderful resource and we hope to continue to share that uh, with various communities going forward as well. Um, so we started out, I suppose we heard that there was a motion and that was a, a process that we could take as part of a, a working group within the PPN. And I suppose we were early stages at forming what they call a linkage group, the environmental group of the PPN as well. So. Uh, delighted that Ben and uh, myself and a number of others came together, um, you know, to be really uh, proactively working and focusing on the rights of nature as an issue we could bring forward. So we heard that there was a draft uh, motion, uh, you know, that was uh, obviously possibly maybe what rose, maybe it merged from there. And Alison was also using it in uh, Westmead. So, uh, we picked up on that and we drafted a Galway version. And um, a bit like as Sarah was saying, it's kind of, you know, uh, you're betting cautiously to see how and what steps we take that, you know, between getting Rome PN on board, which polling it as a motion, and uh, the SVC, 
you know, for them to actually take it on board and uh, to kind of inform them, or do we, you know, we weren't sure we should be uh, contacting everybody in advance, or is it going to be this slow kind of learning process uh, to kind of engage and invite people to take on board over a period of time? So we drafted a motion to our, the chair of the SBC in September, and they were having their uh, SBC meeting in October. So we met as a as a BPN uh, linkage group in advance of the SBC, and we spoke to our reps, and we provided them with the motion, and with some background information on the rights of nature movement itself. So uh, we were uh, uh, delighted, I suppose, that there was an overwhelming support for the motion, even if there was still some questions, but there was support for the motion going forward. And there, there was also support for um, uh, writing a letter of support to the Citizens' Assembly uh, recommendations that were before the Doctors' Committee as well, coming from that uh, linkage group meeting. So I spoke to the chair of the SVC in advance, just before the meeting actually happened, um, just that I hadn't received back any response to the motion that I had emailed. So uh, he's a Green Party member, and he said that... Um, he was very much in favour of seeing true also and that he would offer his support and the PPN reps were going to bring it forward. Then he would try and support it as well. But they did say that they had the uh, climate action um, draft plan or this was each piece of work. So I wasn't sure how much time they could give to it. So what emerged from that uh, uh, SV meetings that they put on hold actually until February and they've invited us to come back and make a presentation on it. So I suppose that we're happy to do that and um, as Rose was saying, it's realising that it is kind of a slow motion process perhaps can maybe yield greater results because it's invite people into a new thinking perhaps for some and a new way of Oh, looks like we've lost her. Or she had a, a dodgy connection there. I, I, yeah. so I think she covered. Over, actually, I think she covered a lot of what we we've achieved. We did also um, try um, campaigning our local TDs and trying to get them to touch base with the members that were connected in their parties and see if their party mandate supported the citizens' assembly. And we asked them to lobby in our behalf the the committee. And we send we send a letter from the Green Recovery Working Group, which is our linkage group, directly to the committee. And um, also, we the SPC, the chair of the SPC, also send in a letter, which we helped draft. Um, and yeah, it was it was interesting talking to the different, uh, I suppose, national politicians to see. Like Sinn Fein were quite supportive. Uh, uh, we couldn't really get Pina Gale to to talk to us at all, and which kind of gives a little bit of a window into what's going on there, because maybe they had something that they weren't prepared to um to, to you know to get engaged with, and uh, Pina Fall very restricted in what they would you know even agreeing in principle was a big thing, but just for myself working on the campaign, I found really encouraging because it's it's nice to be working on for something because I feel like when you're an activist you're always working against I know that you said this in an octus one time and it really Sarah it really struck me that we're always fighting things and I just nice to be working in support of something and you know something that could actually benefit or something in the toolbox for activists as um I thought was fantastic what Thomas said earlier um, I just wonder, oh yeah, and I just thought of it in a way like the pollinator plan, the way that it could be infectious in a way and just kind of permeate everything slowly. Did you want to come in, Anna, and say anything in addition to that? Um, more to, you know, agree with, the, I, with um, for example, having the resource of the films, I think it's fantastic because they're so well made and they're they're very inspirational. And, you know, I just find having those resources at, and having had 
what's going on in in the north and being able to be wel welcomed into that group and um it's such a warm group and inviting group and sharing you know all the information it's all very inspiring and it's been it's been one of the more positive journeys i agree jen